Hey everybody, Dr. Rob here, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health. I am answering a lot of your questions about SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. I get uh, several patients a week inquiring about it, several doctors asking about different protocols, asking how to differentiate SIBO from irritable bowel disease, leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome, and the such. So let's go through some of the different protocols. Let me explain to you what SIBO is. Let's talk about some of the mechanisms that actually should be in place to stop us from getting SIBO and what breath tests, what lab tests, what do I suggest as testing? Um, SIBO's become really, really popular. Let me give you a little uh, interesting stat. The bulk of people, the majority of people that have concussion are extraordinarily susceptible to SIBO. It's up to, in certain articles, 60% of people get a concussion also get small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So just so you know, you should not have any bacteria or a large amount of bacteria in your small intestine. That poses an issue. So let me give you some definitions of what SIBO is. One, as I said earlier, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. It has, it is an excessive amount of bacteria in the small intestine. The large intestine has the bulk of the bacteria. We don't want a ton of bacteria in the small intestine. In addition, the small intestine has a relatively low levels of this bacteria. It is, however, the longest section of the digestive tract. It's truly where all the nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream. And it's a spot where if you get malabsorption of nutrients, you're obviously going to be neutrally, nutrient deficient and also have some digestive issues. So what are some of the mechanisms that protect against SIBO? Well, our body has multiple mechanisms. One of them is getting a lot of bile acids. So as long as we have a high amount of bile acids, that's a great thing. Bile acids, actually bile is sort of an emulsifier for fat. We've always known that. Bile should be high in the small intestine. In addition to bile being high in the small intestine, bile has an antimicrobial effect. It kills a lot of bad bacteria, but it does not affect good bacteria. So we need bile acids to be high. One of the obvious things that happen when you get small intestinal bacteria overgrowth is something or, or some mechanism that allows bile acids to go down. Another thing that's critical to having good health in your small intestine is digestive enzymes, certainly a lot of digestive and pancreatic enzymes. So digestive and pancreatic enzymes are very unique and they help break down the food. The pancreatic enzymes are very unique in that if they're in an abundance, they avoid the ability for the body to make what we call a biofilm. A biofilm is when the bacteria sort of encases and sticks. So clearly we're gonna have low amount of bile acids, digestive enzymes, uh, pancreatic enzymes will lead you down a path getting towards SIBO. Another mechanism is the ability for the small intestine to move the food bolus through it, and that's through the migrating motor complex. The average person having a healthy digestive tract has a migrating motor complex, which is peristaltic contractions, approximately 9 to 11 times. That migrating motor complex is also stimulated, believe it or not, by bile acids and, of course, the mechanism called the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is a critical element. When it is decreased and stimulation is down, the vagus nerve doesn't allow the migrating motor complex to work well. That migrating motor complex with most SIBO patients only contracts about three times. So the body having its own mechanism is digestive enzyme, pancreatic enzymes, bile acids, all being decreased leading towards SIBO and its peristaltic contractions, which is migrating motor complex. Last but not least, we also have something that's called the ileocecal valve. It's sort of the door between the small intestine and the colon. It actually looks like, one of my doctor friends said, more like a flap. So if the flap is closed, you don't get any kickback from the colon into the small intestine. If the flap is open, the ileocecal valve, it's not a valve like this, it's a valve like this, it opens, you get the bacteria back in the small intestine. And the ileocecal valve, again, works with the migrating motor complex, can be stimulated or not, um, affect, not affected in a positive light by a decrease in vagus nerve stimulation. So one of the critical elements that you're gonna have outside the nutritional protocol is to stimulate the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, a critical element, cranial nerve number 10, 
largest parasympathetic nerve. It's your uh, rest and digest nerve. It is part of your autonomic nervous system that really truly is a major factor in your enteric nervous system, your digestive system, and it speaks between the gut and the brain and the brain and the gut. So these are the problems, and this is what can lead you towards SIBO. What tests would you do for SIBO? Well, there's breath tests. I'm not a big breath test fan. Now there's breath tests. Essentially what you're seeing in the breath test is you're testing for hydrogen and methane. If you have high amounts of methane in a breath test, you're gonna usually come with a symptomology of constipation. If you have more hydrogen, you're gonna have more symptomology of diarrhea. The problem is the breath test takes a long period of time and it's just not easy for the patient. I much prefer serum tests. I like to use a Ray 22 by Cyrex, which really determines if we have something called a cytolethal distending toxin and any damage to the intestinal tract. So I'm looking for more damage in this specific area and looking for bacteria being misplaced. I prefer the serum test. If you guys want to see more about cytolethal distending toxins, more about um, leaky gut, I'm going to be at Integrative Health Symposium. We're going to be doing a lot of Facebook Lives. We'll be doing one on Friday at 2.45 with them. I gotcha. And we're also going to be getting some pretty famous docs, well-known docs. I'm going to try and do some interviews and Facebook Lives with them. I will be there lecturing an Integrative Health Symposium on Saturday from 10.45 to 12, talking about the microbiota, gut-to-brain axis, and health and disease. I know you had somebody... Yeah, we have a question. Sure. How do I know I have SIBO? What are the symptoms? Symptoms, great. I over I missed that. I should have talked about the symptoms. So a, lo a lot of issues, you know, SIBO is similar to leaky gut in the symptomology. The symptoms are gas and bloating, fatigue, um, irregularity in going to the laboratory. Um, so SIBO has a lot of specific symptomologies that are very similar to leaky gut and a lot of people think that they just have leaky gut but they actually have SIBO. So while we're there, you can have leaky gut and SIBO. You can have leaky gut and not have SIBO. You can have SIBO and not have leaky gut. So. A good functional medicine practitioner, I actually functional nutrition, a personalized lifestyle practitioner, should be able to differentiate between the two, and you really need those tests to do that because the symptomology is very similar. That was the one? Fabulous. Great question, by the way. So let's talk about a protocol. Let's talk about a nutritional protocol. Number one, obviously, as I said, clearly, I'm going to add some bile salts. Bile salts with bitter extracts because we know that the bile, once again, poses an issue if it's decreased. Bile's got this medicinal effect of people once again in the small intestine in that it emulsifies fat and more so than that it's actually antimicrobial and does work towards keeping regulation of the migrating motor complex. Its own body's own natural peristaltic contractions. Number two, we love aromatic oils with each meal. Aromatic oils I'm going to speak to oregano oil. I love my oregano oil. Oregano oil, you want to take biotics is my favorite oregano oil because it's very slow acting and comes in an emulsified form. So therefore it moves slower and doesn't get wiped through the body. It's been the most effective that I've seen. Berberine, berberine with each meal. Berberine, well, I'm sorry, I want to go back. Aromatic oils also if you have airway issues. Great understanding, aromatic airway. Berberine bowel. This is for your train wreck patient. Anybody that's got any bowel dysregulation, uh, berberine takes the bacteria and walks it out. Big proponent of using berberine. Berberine works with a multitude of different um, systems. Berberine is also great for blood glucose. Saccharomyces boulardii, it's a probiotic. Actually, it's a yeast that functions like a probiotic. Saccharomyces boulardii is a great choice. A lot of literature, a lot of arguments said that you couldn't take a probiotic at the beginning with SIBO. That has been shown to be disproved. You can. Nevertheless, I still recommend Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast, not a bacteria, that functions like a probiotic. Because a key element, I'll be bringing this out at Integrative Health Symposium, is you really don't want to give bacteria till you fix all the gut linings and you have the epithelial barriers back intact. Last but not least, in this section for supplements, I like zinc carnosine. Now, you can take zinc carnosine on an empty stomach. Zinc carnosine has shown really to help build up mucosal lining. Also, what I like about zinc carnosine is it protects the tight junctions in the gut and 
Interesting, zinc carnosine protects against a lot of gut dysregulation and gut issues when somebody exercises excessively. So it's a great tool. The reason you can take zinc carnosine on an empty stomach is that we know that zinc on an empty stomach can actually almost burn a hole in your stomach, but the carnosine is an amino acid and an antioxidant, so therefore it's chelated and goes through real slow, and it doesn't get pumped through too quick. There's no damning effect, so the zinc carnosine is actually healing and very adhesive to the stomach, whereas zinc by itself you, want, you don't want to take if you've got a hole in your gut. The um, diets that you're looking at are the FODMAP. FODMAP is popular. However, I found for compliance, it's the worst diet I've ever used in my office for compliance. You want a FODMAP because you want to avoid as much sugar as you can and sugar alcohols. I like the ketogenic diet. I like the ketogenic diet for a multitude of reasons. Number one, I like the keto because there's a lot of good health factors to the keto. It's easy to comply. There's supplements that work with the keto, MCT oil, ketone salts, um, acetyl L-carnitine, that of chromium, fish oils, that will keep you in ketosis. But what I like about the ketogenic diet in reference to SIBO is that it's 50 grams of carbs or less. You don't want to feed that bacteria. You don't want to feed it a lot of carbohydrates, that energy. Carbohydrates, sugars are deleterious. They're a toxin. So I don't want to go on a diatribe every time about sugar. So we'll just stick to that and just say that we prefer the ketogenic diet because it's a low carbohydrate that has a high compliance for patients while we try and treat and kill the bacteria in the small intestine, walk it out via SIBO. So I've got some others. I'm going to make the switch. And phase two, 30 days later, we're going to use betaine, HCL, and pepsin. There's your digestive enzymes or stomach acids. We're going to add that in. And what I like to do, the reason I say titrate per meal is, I wouldn't say take four and then you go, oh my God, I got a burning sensation, titrate. You want to take one at the beginning of the meal. If you don't feel anything, take one at, at, at the middle of the meal. You want to be able to take betaine HCL up to the point of comfort, not up to the point of burning. And that's a great way to determine if the HCL, that's how much you need of the right amount. Amylase, lipase, and protease, SOD, catalase, all these you're going to continue with bile acids. Here is your prote I'm sorry, here are your pancreatic enzymes. You're going to add now you can add your dairy-free probiotic. You're also going to add a powdered nutritional support. So we use a lot of different uh, nutritional support to regenerate mucosal areas. So some of those um particular ingredients would be glutamine, um, NAC, um, and acetyl glucosamine, grass-fed um, collagen peptides are a great choice, brand-changed amino acids, aloe vera, MSM, and the like, all really good choices to help build up that gastrointestinal integrity. And finally, you want to continue on the keto diet and any modified elimination diet, meaning you want to stay on a very, very low carbohydrate diet. Once you reach clinical outcome, I can tell you, nobody ever, ever wants to get SIBO again. So with that being said, the way to avoid getting SIBO again, and most people think when they go over and reach a threshold that they don't have to watch what they do, you really do. I mean, you don't want it to go back. We always want to eat healthy. We got to take care of our gut. We got to take care of our intestines. The real question is, you know, do you have the intestines for good health? Um, I would continue on um, bile salts, great choice anyway. I think it's one of the most overlooked supplements that a lot of practitioners um, don't consider. So bile salts is something I like to use on many of my patients now, been seeing really good results. In addition to the bile salts and bitter extracts, I also always like, I just drank it before I came out here, I used a um, gut regeneration formula. I love the gut regeneration formulas because I'm trying to keep my gut in the best shape that I can. You know. Um, do you have the guts to be healthy? What have you done for your guts lately? Well, 10 minutes ago, I took a gut regeneration drink. And finally, always continue with a good quality probiotic. So your good choices would be Esperlardi, which is a yeast. Love my Esperlardi. And um, L Plantarum 299V is also great if you also happen to have irritable bowel. One little aside, a study came out. I'm going to share this at Integrative Health Symposium. If you took a probiotic and you just had IBS, only about 10.3% outcome. If you had took a probiotic, well, there was four options. It was Esperlardi, it was uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, I think it was Bifidobactam. If you took one of the four bac uh, bacteria and you had SIBO and IBS, 
you had a 71.3% chance of getting clinical outcome, seven times the chance. So the point there is probiotics work, they even work better with SIBO. So many people used to think we shouldn't take it. The literature is really reversed. We should take the probiotics. So do you have any shout outs, any questions? Uh, there is a question, would SIBO affect would SIBO affect weight loss? Absolutely, SIBO would affect weight loss. So you, if you really want to lose weight, the quickest way to lose good quality weight, not just lose weight because you're not digesting, is to keep your guts in track. So that leaky gut, so we all talk about leaky gut. The question is, is it just leaky gut? Is it SIBO? So answer your question, you should really want to keep your gut intact, your small intestine, your large intestine, intact if that is functioning well that's where your digestive enzymes are that's where the most nutrients are absorbed in that small intestine so yes you'll lose weight because you won't have to eat as much you'll get those nutrients in because you're absorbing at a higher level that's it we're doing great guys get ready for a lot of facebook lives on friday and, and one on saturday i really appreciate all that you're doing feel free to ask any questions um, put a comment. We'll take the comments. We'll answer them at Memorex. If you need um, any uh, consultation or you want to talk, if you think you may have SIBO, please feel free to reach out. Dr. Rob, always yours in health.